it's 924 and GIS is dead. Now I'm kidding, that's a bit of an oversimplification, but I do think in the near future, we will see the end of GIS, at least how we know it today. And there's a few different reasons from the technology changing to job roles. And in this video, I'm gonna talk about my reasons about why I think we'll see this in the near future. And there's five different reasons why I think we'll see the end of GIS soon. But stay tuned to the end of the video and I'll talk about some of the things that you can do to prepare for these changes which are already taking place right now. So you haven't been here before, my name is Matt Forrest. I post videos about GIS and geospatial topics, so if that interests you, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell so you get notifications about new videos, including some live tutorials which I've been starting and kicking off on this channel. So let's go ahead and jump in, and I wanna take a look backwards about what's happened over the last 20 or so years in geospatial and how there's been some monumental shifts that has led us to this point. Now, one of the first and most notable changes within geospatial is, of course, the advent of Google Maps. This came out in 2006 and started to change the way that just about every in the world interacted with maps. More and more spatial tools and dashboards and applications started to move online. So this forced GIS to push itself to bring these tools to an online environment. Now what happened after that is that people wanted to use them to do more exploratory things like they could do in their traditional GIS environments that you couldn't do in a print map or even a desktop toolkit. And this led into that sort of location intelligence phase where people wanted to create interactive insights and dashboards for people to interact with more than just a static map with some points on there that you could visualize. Now, all of these activities, of course, generated more and more geospatial data. You have more people interacting with spatial things and applications, you get more spatial data. So you, of course, need somebody to actually understand and analyze that data. The data volume is larger, and you also have the advent of things like machine learning. So you want to do some predictive modeling on top of that. So around, let's say, 2015 or a little bit after that, you see this advent of spatial data science. Now, spatial statistics really existed before this, so it's not something that's totally new, but spatial data science really becomes becomes a big thing in the industry around this time. Now keep in mind more and more data is constantly being produced. So now you need some toolkit to actually make this data manageable and usable for these data scientists that want to process and run these different things, but at a much larger scale. So now you hit the 2020s and you have all this data that's collected and you have to make use of it somehow, both storing it and making it useful for everyone else that needs to access it and use it. And you get in this concept of data engineering. So going all the way back to 2006, more data is produced, the toolkits look different, everything forced online and in the cloud, you have this entire process happening. It actually looks very similar to something we see in a different but similar field, which is the data analytics or data science community. You know, in the Web 2.0 era, which is when Google Maps started to come out, more web applications go online. And all the time, these applications are producing and creating data. And this data is being stored somewhere and useful, and so people want to understand it. So the first advent of that is business intelligence. People want to see some dashboards, throw that together, and understand what's happening in that data. But then the data gets big, right? And you need to do something else, and you also have these machine learning tools that look very interesting to do predictions. So now you have this advent of data science where people want to produce insights and the predictions from much larger data that can work with this and produce really valuable insights from it. Finally, now the data is getting so big that you need other tools and systems to manage it. You get this advent and growth of data engineering, even into analytics engineering, which we're seeing evolve from the last few years. As you can see, both of these paths follow the exact same kind of trajectory. More data is being produced. You have different roles that actually work with that data to produce some insight. And I think this pattern points to the first thing is that these roles are going to grow. They're not going away. And as the data grows and moves more and more towards an online or specifically the cloud, that new toolkit starts to approach. And that traditional GIS that we had in the early 2000s starts to look a lot different when you consider the volume of data that's being produced today. And that brings me to point number two. Of course, there are still common GIS tasks taking place from processing of data, working with it, creating geometries and boundaries, all these different things that you think of when you're doing GIS. And of course, that, that work still happens somewhere, but more and more as these tools get better, that work can actually be commoditized, productionalized, and automated to actually save a lot of time. And that's a goal that a lot of organizations are trying to get to. How can I make this process automatic so I can focus on these bigger problems downstream? Now, of course, this varies by location. If some you know, geospatial infrastructure is still developing in different areas of the world, that might look different. That toolkit might still be very active and in place, but at some point that's gonna grow enough where you do actually get access to those different things. So this does vary by location a little bit, so keep that in mind. But overall, as you have these tools, if you can automate something, someone's gonna try and do that. 
And you can even see this with different AI tools. This is a really cool plugin that actually uh, helps you automate the drawing of boundaries on top of imagery or anything within QGIS. It's an amazing tool. I love it. You can check out a link to it here. But this just gives you a sense of these basic things that have traditionally been the GIS workflow that are now growing and growing and growing. I also want to take a look at a few of these posts. These are some things that kind of call out what a GIS career might look like and some of the different tasks that are maybe going to get automated in the future and understanding where things are now and where they're going to go. So so people are definitely talking about what this looks like. And that brings me to my third point, which kind of ties to the first one in terms of these new roles and definitions. I mentioned the spatial data scientist, the data engineer, the sort of spatial analyst that's producing these insights and dashboards. These new roles are going to continue to grow as more data grows and as more things move to the cloud, that path is going to continue to happen. Now, it's important to keep in mind that each of these different roles it uses different tools and different processes that look a lot different from traditional GIS. The data scientist works in Python and different notebooks. A data engineer might be using more command line tools or cloud tools and different processing, either in Python or SQL or different languages. And an analyst might actually be interacting with SQL more and then building these into more reporting or dashboard scenarios. So that toolkit is really going to change quite a bit. And it looks different because your focus is on producing outcomes, whether that be for usable data, analytical value or for predictions and forward thinking like that. And we can actually see the evidence of this in terms of the career growth. Now it's not, these aren't perfect numbers. These are pulled from different web sources, but you can take a look and see here's the kind of trajectory for GIS jobs versus the spatial data scientist versus geospatial data engineer. This is definitely changing over time and I expect that to continue to grow. The other evidence of this is actually the disparity in salaries here. If you look at the different salaries that I'm showing on the screen right now, there's actually a pretty big difference. That tells me one of two things, either that these jobs are much more technically difficult and that is warranting the higher pay and salary, or that there is a smaller pool of candidates. So the companies have to have higher salaries to attract those potential candidates. Now, my fourth point is that technology is inevitably going to change. Like things are going to change. We've seen it over time. This has been tracked and documented since the industrial revolution. And the specifics that I wanna focus in today is this migration to the cloud. It's, it's inevitable that things are gonna to move to the cloud. This is happening already. And I think that most major organizations that have had on-premise or on-site servers or infrastructure like that are going to be moving to the cloud. And that means larger tools, data engineering tools, all these different things together. Now there's two different stories that I think actually show the evidence of this. The first is this talk by Dr. Michael Stonebreaker. He is the creator of Postgres and has talks about these top 10 blunders of big data that the ODSC conference. And I think the one that I want to point out is actually this inevitability of the moving to the cloud. Things are going to move to the cloud. So these traditional GIS setups of having an on-prem server and server layers and things like that, I think are eventually will go away. They aren't going to go away overnight. And I think that is actually referenced by the second story, which is the history of Oracle. Right? Oracle is this big database company that's still performing quite well if you look at the markets today, but then you see this explosion of these other tools like data warehouses and things like that. So why is Oracle still sticking around? Well, it's really hard to like just get rid of it. So, you know, it's embedded in these critical tools and applications in so many business applications around the world that it's you can't just leave right away. I think that eventually will continue to grow, but look at Amazon. Amazon was on Oracle and it took them 19 years to get rid of all their Oracle services. This is one of the biggest cloud companies in the world and it took them 19 years to get rid of Oracle. So traditional GIS is not going anywhere anytime soon. But I think you will see that gradual bit by bit decline and that will eventually roll over. I don't think it's going to go away even in the near future. But these other tools, I think you'll start to see this massive growth as people want to work with more data and do these more advanced analytical processes. So the technology is going to change. There's no doubt about that. And I think that's a big indicator of what we start to see. So all of this brings me to my last point, and that is that GIS is just a technology. When we talk about job roles like GIS analyst or GIS technician, we're really talking about someone that knows and understands the technology or setting up the technology to create different processes or outcomes. I think that's one of the biggest disagreements I have with the term GIS as a practice area is that GIS or geographic information systems is really just the technology, the tools to perform geospatial analysis. I think one big trend we'll start to see is that more and more people will start to understand or see themselves as spatial analysts. And what that really means is that all of us working with geospatial data or doing these different things are really geographers. We have a curiosity or an interest about things in the world that we want to understand and learn more about. And GIS is just a tool to help us do that. 
The same way that the tools that will move into the future will help us do those things as well. Those new roles like spatial data scientists will help us predict and use machine learning and new technologies to actually understand what the future might hold. Data engineers will help prepare and make the data super useful for anyone downstream to actually do that at scale and understand these things at planetary scales and much more granularity than we ever thought before. And that new term I'm calling out, spatial analyst, which isn't really a new term, but I'm using it in a little bit of a different way here, will actually use that data to create new outcomes and help everyone understand what's happening in our world as it's changing, evolving, and doing all these different things that we want to understand. So the big question is, what can you do about it? And I think there's three things that you can do to help prepare for this end of GIS, as I'm calling it. The first thing is understand where you want to go in this new paradigm of different operations like spatial data scientist, data analyst, data engineer, and even more that we'll see evolve over time. Understand what works well for you. What interests you? Do you like working with the data? Do you like the statistical analysis? Do you like presenting outcomes and talking about it? Understanding where those different pieces are will help you set up for the future to understand which area you want to operate in. The second is understand what that role looks like. Understand the tools and technologies that are changing and evolving and start to learn them and practice them over time so you can be prepared for that upcoming shift. And the third is start to position yourself in that space. If you work in any geospatial field or GIS field, start to understand where you want to fit, learn those tools, and position yourself as a key player within that space. If you do all those different three things, I think you can really be set up for success in the future as this shift starts to change over time. Now, I know this is a hot topic, so please add your thoughts in the comments. I know there's going to be a lot of different debate and different ideas around this topic. Let's put it that way. So please add that down below. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do. If you hit the bell, you'll get alerts about my new videos, including new live videos, which I'm starting to launch. So there's new tutorials that I'm putting out on a regular basis. And that just helps with the algorithm to get this out to everybody in different ways. So thanks for the spending the time. I hope you enjoy this video and I hope to see you again soon.